Hello fellow podcasters, today I've got Daughter of the Deep by Rick Riordan. And today I will provide a constructive review of this book, we're starting with a very simple, spoiler full plot summary, and then my kind of my criticisms and my take on the book and an overall rating. So let's get straight into the plot. So the book is about Anna Dakar, who is the main character and whose lost parents at sea. She is a very vibrant person who loves the sea and who is friends with a dolphin named Socrates. And she attends the Harding Pencroft Academy, which is a producer of the best underwater explorers, marine biologists and scientists, and military personnel in the world. Basically, it's a very, very elite, very, very secluded, kind of mysterious private high school. And Anna has a brother named Dev Dakar, who is like the perfect boy. And he's he's her she's her older sis older brother, and they are very very close. And the Harding Pencroft, the school that she goes to, has four houses, and these four houses are mentioned at the start of the book. And I'll give I'll show them to you because this is basic information that we kind of need to understand the book as a whole. And here are the houses, and these are actually all of the main characters. But Harding Pencroft Academy, first house, House Dolphin. Communications, exploration, cryptography, and counterintelligence. House Shark, command, combat, weapon systems, and logistics. House Cephalophod, I don't know how to say that. Engineering, applied mechanics, innovation, and defensive systems. House Orca, medicine, psychology, education, marine biology, and communal memory. So there are these four lovely houses at uh, the Harding Pencroft, and they all work together towards a certain goal. And Anna is now in grade 9, which means she gets to get into the more serious stuff at the Harting Pencroft. Apparently, they must go to do their seed trial. And this is like this important trial that everybody talks about. All of the older kids in grade 10 and grade 11, they all talk about this really, really, really important test. So Anna is very hyped up, and so is the rest of her grade. And so they go to the seed trial under the guidance of Dr. Hewitt who is the supervisor and who teaches theoretical marine technology. Then, however, while they're going, the Harding Pencroft Academy, it gets attacked. Torpedoes destroy the entire place, and all that's left is a bunch of rubble. And this isn't good, because that means apparently the Land Institute, who's an arch nemesis of the Harding Pencroft Academy, well, they're here to hunt them down and kill them, and they want Anna because they need to know the location of a certain place and they need Anna to get there. I mean, so basically, Anna finds out that uh, apparently all of the stuff from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and the Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, yeah, most of that stuff, that's real. Captain Nemo's a real person and all of the people involved are real people. And the people who are involved in Saw Nemo's technology divide into two groups. One led by Ned Land, who feared Nemo's technology and made the Land Institute to try to get all of Nemo's technology and take control of it. Meanwhile, who was sort of protect Nemo's legacy and his technology is Harding and Pencroft from the first book, who basically they kind of take Nemo's technology, protect Nemo's line, and make sure that the technology doesn't fall into wrong hands. And Anna, our main character, is actually related to Captain Nemo or Prince Dakar, and hence is the only one who can use the full potential of Nemo's technology. And so, on the Varuna, the boat that, they are, that the Harding Pencroft owns, they set out sail to find Lincoln Island, where Captain Nemo's old submarine, the Nautilus, still lays dormant alongside his corpse. And they must go there and make sure Anna can use the Nautilus, because the Land Institute is close behind. So they take the boat and they try to find Lincoln Island, and on the way they do encounter some difficulties, like the Land Institute actually attacking, but thanks to Gemini Twain, who is a bodyguard who is a shark house bodyguard and all of her friends ingenuity Anna manages to push through as the captain of the boat and reach Lincoln Island. There they discover that Nautilus is actually a type of artificial intelligence. Basically it's alive. And they while they're trying to take control of Nautilus the Land Institute who's tracked them back to Lincoln Island attacks them and a final battle ensues where the kids run away on the Nautilus meets a giant octopus, and with the octopus's help, destroys the Anorax, which is the submarine that kind of copied the Nautilus that um, the Land Institute made, and they fight, they win, they manage to have an epic battle with some fake rubber bullets with um, 
Dev, because apparently Anna's brother Dev is one of the bad guys. And yeah, they win the battle, and it's a happily ever after, and they all swear that they're gonna rebuild the school. And that's the plot. So, my review. First of all, I love the steampunk aesthetic combined with AI. I never really thought that the concept of an artificial intelligence could really meld together with a steampunk aesthetic, because we kind of can perceive AI as something that's very modern, right? Very cyberpunk aesthetic. But instead, uh, Riordan combines this AI concept with a more steampunk aesthetic uh, in a very natural way, and I really, really like that. I really did like the snarky character dynamics between the main character and the side characters, but again, it kind of felt typical to me because I'm so used to Ryarden writing. Uh, for me, again, overall, it just felt like a more polished version of the Percy Jackson books, but it kind of felt like a used concept just because of the style of writing, right? Like, it's like, oh my gosh, like, Greek myths are real, and then Egyptian myths are real, and then the Norse gods are real, but now the the Land Institute and, and, and the Anoraks and Captain Nemo is real, you know? Like, it's, it's kind of on the same line, right? It's in Branford Rick Riordan, though, and I don't hold him against them. And also, like, again, like, some of the plot twists and the conventions that Riordan kind of uses, I feel like he kind of repeats them a little bit, you know? Like, the artificial intelligence of the Nautilus kind of being similar to how the Argo 2 was in the Heroes of Olympus series, that boat there is that's literally on the cover, right? Is is an is an AI, right? It's alive. It's it's Festus the Dragon. It's basically the same thing, right? And then um, Dev betraying at the end in an epic twist felt very similar to the first book, Luke Castellan being revealed as the traitor and the lightning thief. So um, I'm not saying that it felt less genuine than Ryder's other works or any less passionate or that his writing got worse. However. It might be because I'm just older, right? And I'm and I'm used to um, the conventions. And also, just these books are part of my childhood now. This one isn't, and that and it just feels like almost like a watered down version to me, at least, of the books that I read as a kid. And that's that might literally just be because I'm biased and I read these books first. I mean, I've heard a bunch of other Riordan fans say this is like his best work. And technical wise, I do agree. It's it's very polished. It feels like a very polished like a polished consumer product almost. And and my personal wish for Ryordan is that I wish he would delve into more philosophical and moral depth within his writing. It felt like we were kind of sort of getting into that direction of like genuine moral conflicts and stakes uh, in the Heroes of Olympus series, especially in the especially in like these three books, the Mark of Thena, the House of Hades, and the Blood of Olympus. Like we had stakes, we had misunderstandings, we had frustrating plot points, we had bad things happen, we had stakes, we had moral conflicts, and I just thought that was just so much more compelling because it felt like something was being lost, something was at stake when we were doing these things, and when these events are happening. And that kind of made me think like there is a distinct lack of stakes overall in this book because the only stakes is like, oh, if the Land Institute wins, the government gains all the Nemo technology, which would indirectly cause the world to implode because the technology is too advanced and humans kill each other, woo woo. Um, and that's not really clear stakes, right? There's like several steps, like, oh, the government, the Land Institute wins, and then the government gets the technology, and then they use it to destroy the world. Like, the logic correlation, there's a bit of, eh, eh, it's iffy, right? So, I mean, I get that we need to protect this technology, but it doesn't feel like this threat is like world threatening, but they try to make it seem like it's world threatening. While in these books, it's it's definitely world threatening. We know it's world threatening, and we're trying to stop the literal apocalypse. And those stakes were made clear from the start, and hence the conflict and every single little event felt more charged. It felt like there was more that was gonna happen. There were consequences to their actions. Of course, um, this book kind of undid some of the stakes that were present in these books and these books, but even so, in the original Riordan kind of, what I consider to be the original Riordan books, which is the Percy Jackson series, the Heroes of Olympus series, the Kane Chronicles series, that I believe that those three series I kind of see as the OG Riordan books, um, I feel like they had a better sense of stakes, of of pacing, of kind of, of almost fear, right? and and consequences, and that, that's kind of what's something that I would emphasize that I felt like was a little bit lacking in this book. Of course, again, it's a middle grade book, right? Like, it doesn't need to have like, oh, scary stakes all the time. But I felt like, you know, it, there just could be more. 
And it, again, it might be a genre preference thing, right? Right? Because I, I read and enjoy and I write YA, young adult. This is middle grade, so it might be a little too young for me, right? So again, like consider these biases and these perspectives. But uh, overall, I thought it was a good book. It was really well paced, as usual, from, from Ryder. The character dynamics, the characterization style was great. The plot was enjoyable. So yeah, I, I don't think there's a problem with it necessarily. It's just, I felt like it could have been more, right? It could have been even better than what, what, this, what this was. And the reading experience was nice. Overall, I thought it was a good book. I would recommend it in your free time just for a nice quick read. Uh, it was very interesting. I would definitely recommend this to like kids as well, like younger grades. I would, I think, would definitely enjoy this book. Um, but I don't know, like, if there's any other like OG, older Riordan fans out there, well, what do you think about this book? Do you feel like, do you feel the same as me that the book is a little bit, feels almost like a little rip off from the old Riordan books? Or do you think, you know, this is a complete new, fresh take? I don't know. Leave your opinions down in the comments below. Have a great day, everyone. And like always, your plot quester and a plot quester. Goodbye.